Well, very good afternoon to all of you, wherever on earth you might be. It is a pleasure to be here in Kennewick today. Um, it seems like there's always a crisis du jour, and the current one in Spokane happens to be with faulty internet service, and we've come to the place where we can't rely on the streaming quality that comes out of our, our, our uh, location there, so thus, here I am. And we decided, well, we'd just make a trip down and see the folks here in sunny, well, the land, as I refer to the land of perpetual sunshine down here in the tri-city part of, of Washington. It is a pleasure to be with you, but I, I do uh, solicit your prayers re regarding, uh, you know, issues that come along. And we, it's not like Mark and I have a great deal of surplus energy. We can go running across the face of the earth. Now, there was a time when we did and not thought nothing of it. But anymore, why, we try to preserve most of the energy to be used, you know, fairly close to home, like out the backyard there and back and so forth. But we're, we'll get along best we can, and we're here to, you know, fight another day, and so be it. But uh, it is a, a sobering time. I was, I'm think, sitting here listening to, uh, to Rick read that article out of the United Kingdom and thinking, dear God, where is it going to end? And one might wonder where it's going to end. Well, I don't think we really have to under, wonder. I think we do know, but uh, getting there uh, might do, you know, going to have to experience who knows what. Well, the ser sermon today is entitled From the Foundation of the World, and a lot of things have been going on from the foundation of the world that God is, uh, is doing and he's made us privy to. And it's a privilege to know in spite of difficulties that exist in the world, it's, it's nice to know how things are going to turn out. And uh, even though there might be a rough road ahead, you know. Well, I have an interesting article here that I'd like to, to, I'm going to reference here several times in the course of this sermon, but I think it helps focus our attention on some of the challenges that exist in the world today. In September of 1977, NASA, that's the National Aeronautic and Space Agency, I launched Voyager 1. It's a, a deep space probe, 1,592 pounds of robotic, high-tech stuff. <laughs> the mission was to explore the outer portions of our solar system and then eventually off into interstellar space. So marvelous, you know. We, we're at that place in, in human development where, you know, we can send a, a spacecraft, unmanned in this case, way off out into the outer uh, portions of our, of our solar system. Well, the spacecraft traveling at 40,000 miles an hour is the most, man, most distant man-made object from Earth and the first one to leave the solar system. Now, the Voyager 1 was expected to work only through the Saturn encounter, and when the spacecraft passed through the planet in 1980, Carl Sagan, well-known astronomer, now deceased, uh, proposed the idea of the space probe taking one last picture of Earth before it passed off into, you know, the outer reaches of whatever is out there. Now, he acknowledged that the picture would have very little scientific value as the Earth would appear too small for Voyager's cameras to make out any detail, but it would be meaningful as a perspective on our place in the universe. And so, indeed, uh, it took a while. I mean, he made the proposal in 1980, but they didn't get around to actually doing it until 1990 because there were other projects backed up and that took priority and so forth. But finally, they did get around to it. And in March, or yeah, March and May, for between March and May of 1990, Voyager 1 returned 60 frames back to Earth while the radio signal Tra with the radio signal traveling at the speed of light for nearly five and a half hours to cover the distance. So Voyager 1 is out there 3.7 billion miles from Earth sending back radio signals and they were able to capture 60 frames. All right. So three of the frames received uh, showed the Earth as a tiny point of light in empty space. Each frame had been taken using a different uh, color filter blue, green, and violet, respectively. And then the three frames were recombined to produce the image that became 
the famous pale blue dot. You may be familiar with it. That was the image that came back from Voyager 1, 3.7 billion miles out into space, looking back, and what they could co capture that represented Earth was a pale blue dot. Well, just how big a dot, you know? I mean, uh, when um, Carl Sagan gave a, a lecture at, at uh, what was the university? Cornell University in 1994, and he was talking about this, so he would have had a big screen uh, and the big image there, and he could have pointed to the pale blue dot. Well, I don't have that today, but let's imagine uh, just a checkerboard, chessboard. You're familiar, we're all familiar with one of those. They come in various sizes, but they're square, and they've got 64 squares on it, you know, eight rows of eight. All right, so it's convenient because uh, the arithmetic is such that in these uh, frames that were sent back from the Voyager, each one contains 640,000 individual pixels that compose the, you know, the picture. And so, all right, it makes it, the math easy, 64 squares, 64,000 pixels, that's 1,000 pixels per square. You know, you're talking about relatively small space. Well, the question comes up then, how many pixels did it take to depict that small pale blue dot? Well, that's the wrong question. How many pale blue dots can you put in a single pixel? Eight, as a matter of fact. So you realize how tiny this thing was. And it just, you know, kind of oh, boggles the imagination to think about, about the whole concept. So here we are, 3.7 billion miles away, looking back at the planet Earth, and there's just this little pale blue dot. And it makes you think, at least brought to my mind, the statement in, in uh, Psalm, you know, chapter 8, where David, perhaps, uh, in the, uh, you know, in the hills of... Uh, of Bethlehem, watching the sheep at night and, and looking out at, at, at the skies, you know, no light pollution whatsoever, and looking up there and, and asking the question, you know, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? How far, far away, such a tiny little speck from way out there. And that's just at the edge of our solar system. And what did David see in the heavens? Well, he was looking at what? The galaxy? what we call the Milky Way. He was looking at stars light years away. And here, the Voyager 1 was looking back from the edge of our solar system. The closest star to our solar system is Alpha Centauri. It's 4.3 light years away. It would take light 4.3 years to travel from Alpha Centauri to the Earth at 186,000 miles per second. You know, it kind of boggles the mind to consider just how utterly far off we are and how tiny we are relative to the overall scheme of things. So, we come then to the reflections. It's interesting because Carl Sagan then, in, in his uh, lecture at Cornell University, he, he focused on, the ref on reflecting back on that and what it meant to him. And I think his comments are, are worthy of our time here today. They're just three paragraphs, and I'll, I'll read all three of them. But he started out by saying, we succeeded in taking that picture from deep, deep space, and if you look at it, you see a dot. That's here, that's home, that's us. He would be pointing to the, to the uh, graphic that he had. And on it, that little pale blue dot, on it, everyone you ever heard of, Every human being who ever lived, lived out their lives on that pale blue dot. Right? The aggregate of all our joys and sufferings, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilizations, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every hopeful child, every mother and father, every inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on a moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. A moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. Well now, that's interesting, isn't it? Isaiah would make reference, you know, in stirring up the, the people to return to God. He would talk about the nations being, you know, less than the small dust on the scale. 
a whole nation. Not doesn't provide enough mass in God's view to even move the scales in the slightest little bit. The, the smallest dust. What is man that, you, that thou art mindful of him? The earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Think of, now notice, this is particularly insightful, I think. When you look at the conditions that exist in the world, and you know, it doesn't seem like things are getting any better. There are all manner of difficulties in every corner of the globe, it seems. The earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that in glory and in triumph they could become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. Here's the pale blue dot, and we're willing to spill rivers of blood in order to be the master of some fraction of that dot. Think of the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants of one corner of the dot on scarcely distinguishable habitants of some other corner of the dot. How frequent their misunderstandings, how eager they are to kill one another, how fervent their hatreds, our posturings, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe are challenged by this point of pale light. Now, you see, it, it, you're beginning to get the impression, I think, as certainly I did, that, that Carl Sagan is, he looks at that, that pale uh, blue dot and, and he's getting a little bit, uh, you know, more morose here. And what are the prospects? And, and uh, you know, it doesn't look too good. Paragraph three then, reflections on the pale blue dot. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark, in our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. Oh, wow. That's a pretty tough position, isn't it? He doesn't see any hope. that there, He can see that there's going to be a need to save us from ourselves, but he doesn't see any hope. There's just this little pale dot out there. Now, I find it interesting, and, and Carl Sagan certainly uh, il is a good illustration of the point, how easy it is, you know, to, uh, to look at the world and, and uh, make an assessment based on our, our understanding or our ideas or whatnot. Now, what he's actually done here is dismiss the, the presence or existence of God. There's no help coming from anywhere. There is no God out there that's going to rescue us. It's up to us, he says. It's been said that astronomy is a humbling, and I might add, a character-building experience. To my mind, there is perhaps no better de demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly and compassionately with one another and to preserve and cherish that pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. Now, I'd like you to turn to Matthew chapter 22. And what we have illustrated here is Carl Sagan has come to grips with the two great commandments in the law. And he has dismissed the first great commandment and embraced the second as our only hope. And this, I think, is typical of human experience. Chapter 22 of Matthew, uh, beginning... In verse 36, so one comes to him, verse 35, one came to him, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, teacher, rabbi, what is the great commandment of the law? And I don't know what he expected to, to, uh, to gain or what kind of advantage he was seeking in testing Jesus this way. And Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, all right? And then he goes on to say, the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. All right, now let's go back to Carl Sagan's statement for a moment. And notice what he says. He says, in, all, in our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. There is no God. God doesn't exist. 
So what have we done? We've taken the one, ha, who, you know, you're in a real quandary here. We know and understand that eternal life is what? To know the one true God and Jesus Christ whom he sent. If you don't even believe that God exists, what are your chances? What are your options? It really is dismal. It really is dismal. So he dismisses the second commandment, but immediately rushes to embrace, I'm sorry, did I say second? He, 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 he dismisses the first great commandment and immediately embraces the second, which is to love your neighbor as yourself. All right, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly and compassionately with one another and to preserve and cherish that pale blue dot that is our only home. Now think about it for a moment. We have the two great commandments. Why is it that Carl Sagan is unable to see that there is a God? David, from his humble position, you know, like I say, on a moonless night on the hills around Bethlehem, with his sheep probably laying in the, in the grass with his sheep looking up, and, and behold the wonder that is God and, and the miracle that, that he sees. Carl Sagan, a learned astronomer, uh, looks at our position and, and sees it as one of, of distance, of isolation, of obscurity, with no hope. How does that happen? Well, you know, we're familiar with the principles, but it doesn't hurt to, re you know, to, uh, to review them. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians. And in, in one sense, you know, we are in a privileged position. We have understanding that others do not. And it's not to puff up our vanity one way or another. But in writing to the Corinthians, Paul wrote verse, chapter 2, verse 9, As it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. See, it's tragedy that educated and intelligent people feel that they have to depend only on human resources to somehow make everything turn out all right. When in actual fact, there's a, there's a work going on, and has been going on from the foundation of the world, that's going to make things right one day. So, you see, there are just certain things that mankind of himself is not able to see, does not comprehend. And I guess we were all pretty much in the dark until God takes the scales away and gives us the opportunity to see and comprehend. Verse 10, but God has revealed them. God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. Oh, you want understanding? You want to comprehend the meaning of this pale blue dot? Well, guess what? That comes from special revelation. God doesn't reveal things to people who don't want to have it revealed. What we find out about the knowledge of God is it is very disruptive. You ever notice that? You get the truth of God and it just disrupts everything, turns your whole world on its ear. And we're all, we, I, we could sit down, we could swap yarns and tell stories, war stories about all the things we had to do to adjust to simple things, like the practical application of the Sabbath day. And what that did to your, to your little world and what your plans <coughs> were for the nearer and far future. Huh? God has revealed them to us through his spirit, for the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man, what, I'm sorry, for what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him. Carl Sagan was a great uh, astronomer because of the spirit in man that was in him. And the qualities that God gave him as an individual he, when he died, he probably had his, at that stage of his life, he probably had as good an understanding of the, of the greater universe as any human being on the face of the globe. And yet, he couldn't see the deeper things of God. Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Right? Well, if you don't acknowledge that God exists, then how can you know and comprehend the things of God? Well, the simple answer is you cannot. And so then you're left to your own devices. And what do you think are the odds now of mankind collectively coming to, more, to, to, to treat one another more kindly and compassionately as we sort through our various challenges and bring heaven on earth? What are the odds? Huh? It's not looking too good. Verse 12. 
Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit was from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. All right. So, once again, you know, you, you have, <laughs> we have this, mankind has a yearning, you know, to make things right. He wants things to, to turn out right. He wants everything, to, everybody to live at peace and everything to be nice. And we don't seem to find any answers uh, in going to God or in some concept of God. You know what I found over the decades now in my own personal life and in the lives of others that I am, you know, have, have uh, you know, been associated with, we, um, you know, we, we come up against the, the truth of God and we have to, we just have to acknowledge that, you know, God's purpose is not to satisfy our expectations. God doesn't care what my expectations are, all right? God has his expectations, he has his plan and purpose laid out, and it's important for me then to get in harmony with it, right? Is that, is that such a hard con concept to, to wrap your head around? You see, God isn't there to please us. <laughs> We're called on to please God. Jesus, God said of his own son, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Right? And so what would he say of you and me? Well, same thing. We are to please God. Our lives are to be an example uh, that God you know, is, is happy to have. Well, you know, it's just, a, it's just an interesting thing that, um, you know, we've got to come to grips with the fact that, ah, I'm not in charge. It's God's business. Chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians. Once again, memory scripture. Chapter 1, verse 26. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Really? Well, that explains a lot. <laughs> you know, <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> I get it. <laughs> I'm not mighty and I'm not noble and, and so forth. And okay, that's not hard to, you know, if I find myself now after so many years, I look in the mirror and I, I, what's looking back at me, I say, oh, is that the new normal? You know, <laughs> is that 100% or is that 50%? I shudder to think that that's 100% because if it is, I have a severe attitude adjustment coming, see? to deal with what we have. And, you know, again, and, and just a little diversion here from my own experience. Uh, I had a pretty good run for 68 years. It went pretty well. And the most challenging things that I had was at a time when my mother had to deal with it, okay? <laughs> so it wasn't a big deal for me personally. But now, you know, it's the last seven years have been just been a constant series of things to recover from one right after another for seven consecutive years. And I still can't open my mouth as wide as I am used to because of the healing of this tooth extraction, which is probably a good deal. Most human beings shouldn't open their mouths as far and open it as wide as they do, right? So and maybe there's a lesson in that, all right? So, but at any rate, so, you know, I, I'm coming to, to understand what God meant. You know, Paul had this horrible thorn in the flesh and he beseeched God three times and to remove it and he didn't. And what did, God, what did God say to him? My grace is sufficient for you for my strength is perfected in weakness. I, I don't get that. Do you get that? How, how does that happen? Anybody win the Super Bowl if you're, you know, weak? You don't win the Stanley Cup out of weakness? You don't accomplish anything, as mankind sees it, out of weakness. My, uh, you know, my perfection is, uh, or my strength is perfected in weakness. Wow. Of all the weakness I see around me, uh, we must be due for a tidal wave of perfection any moment now, right? And I would hope so. Eventually, we will. So we go, let's go on. Verse 27, for God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. Well, yes, the day will come, won't it, when the weak and foolish of this world will put, will put to rest all the alternatives that have ever been, uh, you know, paraded by God as alternatives to the right way. The base things of the world 
and the things which are despised God has chosen, and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. Why? That no flesh should glory in his presence. There will be no, no flesh glory in God's presence. So we might as well get used to that and recognize that that's not the purpose. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. That's a quote from Jeremiah. And so here we are. You know, we, there is a reason why some people understand and some people don't. You know, you you know the principle. God, it's to who to whom does God look? He that is weak, meek, and lowly. Chapter fourteen of Luke. Now I made the statement earlier that the truth of God is disruptive, and and, and as in the example of Carl Sagan's reflections on this pale blue dot, he dismisses the great commandment. He just doesn't exist. He just doesn't acknowledge that God exists. Well, that kind of puts you at a disadvantage, doesn't it? If that's if that's the case, and so, but then he he immediately then embraces the second great commandment. Now that's what takes place in the world around us, and we see it often. Now, again, the 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 nature of God's plan and purpose as it works out on this earth, which is hostile to God, is is when when we come into to grips with and in in, the, in you know in close connection or harmony with the truth of God, it's very disruptive in our lives. Now, I want you to look, Luke 14, and again, uh, you know, on, upon another reading, some of these things come a little clearer to us. Great multitude, says verse 25 of Luke 14, went with him, went with Jesus, and he turned and said to them, <laughs> great multitudes following him, must have been following him for some reason. But he, he said to them in response to their presence, he says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and his mother and his wife and his children and his brothers and his sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And what kind of an outfit is that? Do you see what Jesus is doing? He's demanding 100% allegiance to himself and to the plan of God. And you, you know, you, other sermons have been given upon it. Jesus is on the earth to do the will of his father and, and nothing more, nothing less. So if you're going to become a disciple of Jesus Christ, now look, he's very specific, and it's very personal, brethren. You must hate or love less by comparison your father, your mother, your wife, your children, your brothers, your sisters, yes, and your own life also, or you simply cannot be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the firstborn among many sons, among many children. So our we have to place ourselves properly. Now, what happens when the truth of God comes? Well, I used to think, well, okay, sure. Back in the beginning when I was, you know, just this standard Orthodox Protestant kid growing up in my little hometown, you know, Boy Scout and playing ball with the kids and all that sort of stuff, going to the prom and all that. Well, okay, fine. I, I come to an understanding that I, I don't have the, all the truth, and I'm beginning to make some corrections. So you start tossing in the Sabbath and the holy days and no tithing. Yeah, okay. And, and well, you just got to be careful. You can't just put anything in your mouth to eat or not eat and that sort of thing. And you begin to realize, now, wait a second. Now, fortunate for me as I look back on it, I was single at the time. And so, you know, I didn't have children or a spouse and that sort of thing to have to deal with. But, you know, many people did, and it cost them dearly to do things God's way. And it ha so I, but I thought, well, yeah, but once we get things adjusted, you know, okay, I'm keeping the Sabbath and the Holy Days and I've given up all those other things, you know, Christmas and Easter and, and all the things, and it upset. And I'll never forget my grandmother <laughs> looking at my brother and I and saying, why do you want to go back into Old Testament bondage, she said to us. Well, Grandma, you know, uh, obedience is not bondage. What else can I say? And later when the legalists were on our back saying, well, that's legalism, well, Obedience is not legalism either. All right? Well, now, this is very personal. And I don't see that Jesus... Now, see, here's the thing. It's kind of hard to say. But stop and think about it. Jesus doesn't have any compassion for someone who chooses personal relationships, the second commandment, over the first commandment. See? 
There's no compassion there. No, no, I mean, uh, sorry, there's just no room to negotiate. We, got, we have got to put the first commandment first. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your mind, and all of your Well, that was then. I am all adjusted now and everything's fine. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so, you know, new understanding comes and you'd say, well, that shouldn't be hard. The church of God as a, as a unit, as a whole, would just embrace it. Run to, you know, to just wrap your arms around it and rejoice to high heaven that God has revealed yet additional information about who he is and what he's doing. Not so. And we have people, and there, there are those of us, many of us in this room and elsewhere, listening to my voice now, who have had to go through some rather disruptive circumstances. You know, you've had to examine your church community, you've had, and people have had to go back again and, and decide, well, who am I going to put first? Am I going to put God first, or am I going to put my, my, you know, my parents or my siblings, or how about my children, you know? I mean, the truth is the truth. I mean, what did we do when the Sabbath was an issue? Did it make any difference what the kids thought? Got to keep the Sabbath. We're going to the feast. Never asked the school whether I could take my kids to the feast. I said, we're going to the feast. See you when we get back. Right? <laughs> right? And so, and so, yeah, it's, but here we are. Now, come down the, the pike here a ways, and, and, you know, we have, we have people who, who aren't interested in embracing the truth. They're more interested in maintaining the status quo. It's friendly here. It's nice here. Well, never mind what God is revealing about himself. We'll just set that aside, okay? And, and it gets, you know, we love one another, and it's okay. Well, is it? Well, you know, make a choice here, see? So there are no excuses. And, and see, God has the end in mind, and you and I do not. So I'd, li I'd be happy to have drawn the line way back in, you know, 19... 65, 68, at the time I'd made some of those basic adjustments. But I didn't realize the bigger adjustments were still ahead. So it's a serious thing. God is about doing work. See, people like poor old Carl Sagan has reduced our options down to a pale blue, uh, pale blue dot out there, uh, hanging out, you know, a moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. It's quite a picturesque description of of uh, our circumstances. So we have these things that we have to deal with. And it's not always easy. So, again, God's knowledge is disruptive in this world. That is not oriented toward God. So, okay. And again, I, I, I focus on Carl Sagan's perspective on the pale blue dot to help illustrate a couple of points. And of course, the one point being how easy it is to set aside the one great, the great commandment and then embrace the second and think that everything's okay. Well, oh, everything isn't okay. So now, again, the subject of the sermon is from the foundation of the world. So Carl Sagan doesn't think there's gonna be, there's no help, there's no evidence of help coming from anywhere. Well, okay. Actual fact, from the foundation of the world, God has been at work carrying out his plan and purpose. And it's, uh, how can I put it? He's right on schedule. I mean, granted, I'd like him to wrap it up a little sooner than it looks like he's going to. But nevertheless, that's his business, not mine. Let's turn to Revelation 13.8. There are 10 places in the New Testament where the term foundation of the world is, is found. And I, I brought along for show and tell. This is Nelson's Concordance of Bible Phrases, helpful volume. I prefer the book. You don't need electricity, and it doesn't matter if your battery's dead or not, you know. This is a reliable source. But if you have online resources like Bible Hub or Bible Gateway or eSword or something, you know, you just, there it is. Ten of them. You can look them right up. Page 199, page 200 in Nelson's Concordance of Bible Phrases. All ten of them that were there. Well, I'm not going to torture you by trying to go through all ten of them, but we're going to take a look at, at several of them and, and note the significance. What is, has God been doing since the foundation of the world? 
that will confound the, the likes of Carl Sagan and others when the day comes and they, our eyes are opened and they can see it. I suspect when Carl Sagan's eyes are open and he can you know, face the one true God, that he'll accept it. He'll say, oh, that's the reason. That's how it's explained. Wonderful. Let's go to Revelation 13. Here's the first one. And it's interesting, the, the setting in which, this one, which, in which we find this one. The foundation of the world. From the foundation of the world. And here's the setting, chapter 13. And I stood on the sand of the sea, this is verse 1, and I saw a beast rising out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear. Mouth like the uh, mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power and his throne and great authority. We saw in chapter 12 that the dragon is the devil, not old, old Satan. And I saw, in verse 3, I saw one of his heads as it were mortally wounded, and it was dead, the deadly wound was healed, and all the world marveled and followed after the beast. Notice, all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. That's the devil himself, folks. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast who is able to make war with him? Aha, this is it. We have found the supreme authority, and no enemy can stand in our way. Hmm? That what it sounds like to you? That's the setting. So, verse 5, and he was given a, mo a mouth speaking great things and blasphemy, and he was given authority to continue 42 months. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. And it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. All right, now, you see, having the knowledge of God is rather disruptive. One of these days, uh, the devil and all of his armies are going to uh, be directed against the saints, and it says here the saints will be overcome. And authority has, was given him over every tribe and tongue and nation. Here is your one rule, one world government. All right. Then then now I'll watch. Now notice verse 8. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names, now notice, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. All people at that point in history are going to give allegiance to the lamb or to the uh, to the beast, except for the saints. Now, those people who are so aligned with the forces of this world, you know, their names are not written in the book of life. But now, notice the lamb is slain from the foundation of the world, back before there was any sin, and when God was about to set his plan in, perp in motion, he recognized there would be a need for a sacrifice. Things weren't going to go perfectly smooth, you know, just right down the line, everything in order. Because when you give people the opportunity to choose, and so they can decide what they're going to do themselves, lo and behold, it seems like we have this proclivity to make the wrong choice. And the choice being, will you do it God's way or will you do it your own way or some other alternative? There are only two choices, God's way and whatever else you can conjure up. That's all there is. And so, you know, you look back on the beginning, even in the angelic world, Lucifer, when he was created, you know, he's described as, as, as this morning star of the dawn and such things and bright and brilliant and glorious. He didn't need a devil to sin, did he? He came up with the idea on his own. Well, so what do you think human beings will do? Of course, Adam and Eve were placed in the garden, and God gave them a choice. You know, here's one tree. Gave them, now, you stop and look at it. God gave Adam and Eve the entire planet, save one tree. You understand that? The entire planet. And yet, the devil comes along and talks him into thinking, well, you need to have dominion over that one tree also. It just made sense to him. Well, sure, okay. I, you know you know the story. Well, wait a second. How does this work? God knew that these kinds of things would happen. He had to give us an opportunity. Is there one thing God cannot do? You've heard the stories. Can God create a rock too big that he can't lift? <laughs> Nonsense, right? Well, it seems that so... And I don't think it's an assumption either 
God cannot create instantaneously a human being with perfect, righteous character. Think about that. Why do you think God is suffering long with us? Huh? Well, folks, we got a few more rough edges to knock off yet. All right? See? It can't be done instantaneously. He knew there would, have to be a, there would be a time that would have to be a sacrifice. The sacrifice was in place from the very beginning. He knew it would be needed. And the day would finally come when Jesus Christ would have to pay that price. It's not God's failure. It's the natural consequence of people choosing uh, to go their own way, to set aside the one great commandment and just pursue their own, like, uh, their, their own uh, issues one way or another. All right, from the foundation of the world. Luke 11, verse 50. Luke 11, verse 50. In this same vein. Luke 11. And we go back to the paragraph break. Rather than just break right into the verse. Well, verse, again, verse 45. <laughs> One of the lawyers answered him and said, Teacher, by saying these things, you reproach us also. All right, so Jesus is saying some pretty pointed things. And... And uh, some of the people, these onlookers, Pharisees and hypocrites and whatnot, they're taking it as a reproach. So he said, verse 46, Woe to you also, lawyers, for you load men with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets, and your fathers killed them. In fact, you bear witness that you approve the deeds of your fathers, for they indeed killed them, and you build their tombs. Therefore, the wisdom of God also said, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they will kill and persecute, that the blood of all the prophets which was shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation. God knew. Jesus is here stating, God knew that he, there would be a time of trouble. He would send a prophet, a messenger, to say, hey, look, folks, let's get it in order. You're not going to like the, the results of where the route you're taking. Well, it's time to get it, turn it around before it gets to become really painful, all right? What do they do? They kill the messenger, the prophet, and ignore the message. Verse 50, that the blood of the prophets, which was shed from the foundation of the world, may be required of this generation, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the temple. From the foundation of the world, God knew there would be times of trouble. He would send a prophet to warn them and give them an opportunity to repent and turn around. They would kill the, the prophet, the messenger, reject the message, and now here we have what we have. And, and it's no wonder that Carl Sagan would look at the, at the uh, circumstances and conclude that there's no help. There's not, nobody's going to bail us out of this. We've got to do it ourselves. Let's turn to Matthew 25. Another statement about from the foundation of the world. See, Carl Sagan and others, they can't see and understand what's going on. But God has been at work. His plan is in place. It's been going on from the foundation, way back in the beginning. And because mankind cannot see and cannot comprehend, therefore it doesn't exist, well, now that's empty thinking. Matthew 25, 31. Of course, Matthew 24 and 25 represent what is commonly called the Olivet Prophecy, various uh, uh, parables here in 25. Verse 31, Now when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, he will sit on the throne of his glory. Now, note, see, there is a time coming. Oh, help will come. <laughs> the pale blue dot is indeed going to be rescued. And, it, and here we have depicted, you know, here kind of the fulfillment, the fruition of God's kingdom. And it will eventually affect all people, not just English-speaking people of Israelite descent. You understand that, right? Eventually, all people, we're going to have the opportunity to live under God's kingdom. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another. Okay, so, you know, you're going to have a choice. You've got to do it God's way or not. In verse 34, the king will say to those on the right hand, Come and be blessed of my father. Notice, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now, God had in mind from the very beginning, way back before there was anything, this is how it's going to work out. It will eventually be my kingdom set up, and there will be those who will inherit it. 
We have a choice. You know, we have the benefit of being able to make that choice now. As I, you know, I think back at some of the things I fantasized over in my youth and what I thought I was going to accomplish or what I'd like to do, this, that, and the other. Nothing, it all pales into insignificant compared to the opportunity to be a part of those who, got, who will inherit the kingdom of God, which God has been preparing and working for now from the very beginning. And then, of course, the familiar uh, uh, description of those who will inherit it. For I was hungry, you gave me food, thirsty, and you gave me drink, and so forth. All right? From the foundation of the world, God's kingdom is there. Wonderful. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. You know, we think about this prison thing. Well, these are people that were imprisoned because of of righteousness and obeying God, and they got thrown in prison because of it. Oh, not necessarily. I've visited odds and ends of people in prisons down through the years. Most of them weren't there because of righteousness. They were there because they were unrighteous. They made some unsavory, bad decisions, and they find themselves there. And, and so what? Well, oftentimes in that environment, people repent, and they need direction. You talk about a lonely place. Some of you out there in cyberspace, you're by yourself and you're alone, and, and we, I can appreciate that, and I, I feel for you, and I wish we could do better. But boy, you find somebody who's in prison and there for decades, and I've visited them, who, are, who grew up in the church perhaps, made very s serious, you know, under the influence of drugs and alcohol and who knows what all else, made some really bad decisions and find themselves in prison. You talk about a lonely place. So, nevertheless, God is preparing his kingdom. It's going to be available. One day it's going to come. And I remember a, an illustration. I think it was in Vancouver, Washington. Ron Dart was there as a guest speaker, and, and he held up a, a, a hymnal. And he says, now, and he was talking about some of these events, you know, and the, the close of the age, you know. And he says, you know, the hymnal's here, and you can, you can tilt it at an angle and an angle and an angle, and... And nothing happens, nothing happens, nothing happens, and all of a sudden, right? is that the way it's going to happen? When they say peace and safety, then comes sudden destruction? Well, let's be prepared, brethren, because when it starts to happen, when it all starts unraveling, it's going to be too late to prepare. Just be too late. But there's a kingdom, see? And it's been in God's plan and purpose from the beginning, unbeknownst to the likes of Carl Sagan. Ephesians chapter 1, and this will be the... The last one that we touch on today, like I say, there are 10 of them, and they all, well, some of them are, speak of similar circumstances, but this is particular, particularly uh, significant, I think. Ephesians chapter 1, we'll cover the first 12 verses here. From the foundation of the world. So this is a letter written by the Apostle Paul to the church at Ephesus, all right? Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Now note that right up front. We have Paul, he's an apostle of Jesus Christ. An apostle is one sent, pure and simple. He's sent to do what? To take the gospel hmm, to uh, Judea and to Israel, to kings, you know, nations. The good news. And he's an apostle. This is the work of Jesus Christ. They're fulfilling the will of God. Let's note that from the beginning. It's God's will. That's Jesus Christ's stated purpose. I come to do the will of my Father, the works of my Father. The doctrine I bring is the doctrine of my Father. The words I speak are the words of my Father. And so here we are, as it applied to the Ephesians. To the saints who are in Ephesus. So, they're, so those called of God in, are called saints, faithful in Christ Jesus. Now, we're going to see this. There's, this term comes up several times now. In, here it's in Christ Jesus, in him, in the beloved. We're going to see that type of, of terminology several times, and Paul's going to focus on what that means. And we'll take note of that as we, while we're here. He says, verse 2, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, so God the Father is directly involved as is Jesus Christ. You're going to see in Paul's letter here, you're not going to, salvation does not come through either God the Father or Jesus Christ. It doesn't happen that way. You have to be involved with both of them. And otherwise, it just doesn't work. Now notice verse 3 in particular. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Note that? Now this is inflammatory. 
in some people's minds. This is some of that knowledge that is disruptive. Now, there are translations of the Bible who ignore the statement, blessed be the God of Jesus Christ. They just acknowledge that God is his Father. It says, God, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has a Father? Well, who's Jesus Christ has a God? Well, I didn't say it. Paul said it. Am I going to believe it or not? Well, now, there's only one, there's one most high God. There's one living God. Jesus Christ is the son of the living God. But I'll tell you what, this is rather disruptive uh, information on, in the Church of God community these days. All right, again, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has, has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, here again, in Christ. All right, cannot pursue the world and work of God apart from Jesus Christ. Verse 4. I mean, as we saw, you know, he's crucified from the foundation of the world. Just as he, now here's the, here's the statement. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Now think about that. Before the foundation of the world, it was determined that there would be people chosen in Christ Jesus. That would be the pathway. Now, I I'll stop and meditate on that for a moment. Now, again, this goes back to the foundation of the world, the very beginning. It was determined that out of this, well, I'll say hodgepodge of, of humanity, there would be some who would listen. There would be some who would be responsive to God. So then he says in verse 5 going on, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. This is God who predestined these things, chose us in him, that is, in Christ. So it's kind of exciting. It goes all the way back to the beginning. You happen to be the fruit of what God started back before the foundation of the world. Now, that is kind of exciting. You know, I'd rather be special in the eyes of God than special in any various segments of the, of the eyes of the world. So, to the, so, verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us according to in the beloved, made us accepted in the beloved. In him, now notice, here's the part that Jesus Christ plays uh, most prominently and in other things as well, but verse 7, in him, that is in Christ, we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence. All right, so there is a redemption. God is the redeemer. God is the one who loved the world and sent his only begotten son to be sacrificed on our behalf. It was his blood that was shed. From the foundation of the world, it was determined. Well, we are the beneficiaries of that. Verse 7 again, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. God knew there would be sin and there would have to be a remedy for it and this is it. According to the riches of his grace which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Verse 9, having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in himself that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. All right, Jesus Christ is the firstborn among many brethren. Jesus Christ has been designated as the head of the church. The first fruits, you know, will come through that source, through the church of God. First fruits, wonderful. And it's all, you know, in him, as he says, it's part of uh, the work that God is doing. Jesus Christ is central to that work, of course. Verse 11, in him, this is Jesus, also we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. All right, so 
From the foundation of the world, it says, back in verse 4, he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame with him in love. All right, so stop and think about it now. The whole continent, again, there are, there are another half a dozen of these statements from the foundation of the world. See, so, so much is God involved. I mean, he's always been involved from the very foundation of the world. Before there was anything, God had it in mind, how, what he was going to do, how he was going to carry this out, and it's going, to, going according to plan. Now, somebody like Carl Sagan or other observers would look at the situation and see only chaos and see hopelessness. And yet, at the same time, God has been perfectly at work doing what needs to be done. All right, so brethren, you know, going forward now, let's face it, we're in the midst of the holy day season, you know. It's the, the time of God's intervention, the time of reconciliation, the time when the kingdom of God will be established, when, the, when first the first fruits will be harvested and then the great harvest that takes place and the removal of evil. Now, think about it. This is the time of the year when the answers come. Carl Sagan couldn't see any intervention from abroad. We need some kind of intervention, some kind of rescue. Well, rescue is coming. We're part of that rescue. We're in that season of the year now when we celebrate the fact that there is a kingdom of God. And God's been about putting that plan into work from the very, very beginning. It's a great privilege to be a part of that. And, that, you know, it just makes a person, in spite of your weaknesses, in spite of your pain and agony and all, it is a privilege to be among the few, if you will, later to be among the many who will be a part of this great plan and purpose of God. I, it just... You know, every now and again it's good to take a, a, a recess from our aches and pains and just focus there and recognize what a wonderful opportunity and blessing we have. From the foundation of the world, brethren, it is a great privilege to be a part of God's calling and to understand what others mightier and more noble than ourselves do not. All right, well, it's a time of, it's a season of joy, a season of anticipation when the work of God will finally come to fruition and, well, we'll be a part of the solution to take peace that is of God to the whole world. Uh, I consider it a privilege, a privilege. I trust you do too. And I trust now we can go forward and observe the festival and celebrate the day when God will intervene to save us from ourselves, if you will, bring about his kingdom for all.